Hello, BookTube. A while ago, Matthew at Mayberry Book Club made a video asking, has Steve read it? <laughs> has, has Steve read all the books in my library? Steve has read an enormous amount of stuff. He is a professional reader. Is it possible <laughs> that I could pick a book in my library that, I've either, that I either own or have read that he hasn't read? Uh, not to one-up me, and not certainly not to, to aggrandize himself, but just for the fun of it. And it caught on. That video caught on, and a lot of people made response videos to that. And they were a lot of fun for, among other reasons, uh, uh, Hannah at Hannah's Books mentioned that it makes people look at the fringes of their book collections. It makes them pick maybe the much lesser known book that they wouldn't ordinarily talk about on BookTube, but that they would like to talk about, that they did enjoy or have thoughts about. Uh, I found it fascinating and lots and lots of fun. Uh, and that fad uh, ran its course and eventually died down until Daniel at Guilty Feet revived it for season two. <laughs> and we are now in the long, endless, bloody battle, the long, endless Antietam of season two of Has Steve Read It, where every single person in the world seems to be coming to bat, trying to figure out uh, whether or not they can score eight beans all according to the rules that we've devised. The, the bean is the token of victory. A bean is a book that I have not read. And those rules are eight books, uh, no a-hole picks, not, not, not picking something out of anger. This is all done out of fun. You're not picking something out of anger or out of condescension or out of spite. You're, you might be picking lesser known books in your collection, but also another, another quasi-official rule would be you shouldn't pick anything that you know I haven't read. Something so incredibly obscure or uh, unfindable or something uh, some, I, like for instance I, th I think there were some feints in that direction in season one where people had a book privately made by a friend there were 10 copies and they, they put that on their list something like that uh, takes the fun out of all this this is meant to be fun of course I won't have read something like that I won't have read an outdated Linux manual or whatever or a language manual of you know from 50 years ago or something like that no point in adding that it has to be it has to walk the fine line between being off the beaten path and uh still close enough to the beaten path so that i will have read it or could have uh and we've had many entries so far in season two i think we've had so far as many entries in season two as we had in season one and season two is not anywhere near done <laughs> uh, lots and lots of entries cropping up every day all attempting to raise the bar we do not at the moment have a winner and we do not at the moment have a loser we have people who have only one bean we have people who have two beans and we have people who have three beans but we don't have any one at either one of those ends of the spectrum and nobody so far has gotten zero beans but also, nobody has even broken the 50% mark. No one has got to four beans. <laughs> so, we have an entry today. We'll see what what uh, what the luck is here. This is AJ Dunn Reads and Writes. And I'll leave a link uh, to, the, to the channel where these challenges are thrown down. <laughs> Let's see. We'll see what categories they fall under. Because you'll notice, if you've been watching Season 2, that a lot of these books are falling into certain categories. Uh, Kathy Grimm, for instance, with, with a, an innocent smile on her face, introduced the hashtag category, where she adds a book specifically to get me hashtagged again. I had my baptism of fire on BookTube by being hashtagged. I have no interest in having it happen again. Thank you very much. It was the same week. It was the same week that I got hashtagged on on YouTube that I also trended on on Reddit. <laughs> And that was that was my little brush with with uh, the fame that the kids experience these days, and I don't want either kind. Of, <laughs> I trended on Reddit for a good reason, and I hashtagged on YouTube for a bad reason. <laughs> and I don't want either one again. But there's that as a subcategory. Uh, but there's also uh, a much more frequent a much more frequent subcategory would be the face palm, and that is where you know all, all the fun in the world intended to this whole thing on in both directions. But nonetheless, where I look at an entry on a list and I say, what was this person thinking? How could they, knowing what they know about me and my channel, how could they possibly think I hadn't read this book? And then there's the multiple face palm, <laughs> where it's a book, you know, where I've interviewed the author or where I've reviewed many of the author's books, but not that particular one, where the, the easy inference is that 
is that I know enough about the book to have read that to have read that particular one. And then there's what one of you dubbed the quantum face palm, which has not happened yet and may not happen, where a person picks a book that I have reviewed, that specific book, or that I've talked about on this channel in great detail, held up and said I loved it and quoted from it, or worst of all, the ultimate quantum face palm. The quantum face palm singularity would be for someone to pick a book, hold it up without noticing that I am blurbed on the book. <laughs> so that hasn't happened yet. But what about AJ? Will he have any of those? Let's give it a try and find out. The very first book is Tin Man by Sarah Winman. Uh, and this is a yes. <laughs> it, is, it is a yes. I very much liked it. How could I not like a book that Simon Savage called the, a perfect book? I didn't think a perfect book was possible. I was wrong. Simon Savage's now famous quote, his now famous blurb on this book. Did he read the book? I'm willing to grant that. Sure, why not? Didn't think a perfect book was possible, and I was wrong. Mm. Okay. Uh, what's your sample size there? <laughs> I wonder. You read, Simon Savage reads, a very small amount of one very narrow bandwidth of reading and never under any circumstances anything else. <laughs> no history. God, no. No biography. No natural history. No science. No math. No philosophy. No science fiction. No mystery, unless it's got some sort of literary airs and pretensions. No romance. Certainly not, unless it's gay romance, again, with literary pretensions. No horror of any kind. I don't know. No, no, no. I don't have time to waste on those. No westerns. Not ever. Uh, just fiction. And not all of fiction. <laughs> just fiction published after he turned 20 years old. So, no Dos Passos. No Murasaki Shikibu. No, no Kawabata. No Jane Austen. No, no Thomas Wolfe. No Edith Wharton. No, 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 no. So a tiny fraction of a tiny bit of one bandwidth of reading. And yet, I never thought a perfect book was possible. <laughs> okay, well, who knows how many of them might be lurking out there that you don't know about. Uh, needless to say, as I hardly need to point out to any of you who have actually read the book, although Tin Man has its heart in the right place and is very moving, you won't be ten pages into it before you see that a very confident somewhat pompous verdict that it is a perfect book is not true. <laughs> it is not a perfect book. If a perfect book has ever been written, I don't know about it, and I don't read in just one tiny fraction of one tiny bandwidth of all of the Republic of Letters. I actually cover a lot of ground in the Republic of Letters, and I haven't counted for a perfect book. And that includes Tin Man. But I did read it, and it is touching. In a Hallmark card kind of way, it is touching. So... So, but it's a yes, unfortunately. So, so AJ is starting off with a yes, uh, and when we when we go next to the next category, to the next choice, and to a few of the ones that are coming, we come back to that thing that I just said, which is that I cover a, a fairly wide spectrum of the reading world, especially new releases. In the last in the last fifteen twenty years, I returned to the world of book reviewing. First, first amateur, then part-time, then working, where you always have a, a review going, to finally professional. That's all I do. And as a result of that, over those years, my reading has shifted. I mean, read, your reading's an organic thing, right? So my reading, the, the just the shape of it, has shifted. It used to be, uh, when I traveled, for instance, it was 100% what BookTube calls backlist. It was 100% rereads. It was 100% things that I not only read, but read many, many times. The same 17 or 18 books. When I wasn't traveling, when I was stationary somewhere, either, either overseas or here in America, that, that collection would expand. Used bookstores, libraries, even sometimes new bookstores, even though books are eye-wateringly expensive. And during those times, when I was a bookseller, I'd say it was probably 50-50 between between older print, older stuff that's out of print or or not not new anymore and new stuff through libraries or bookstores or whatever and that the shape of that reading has shifted again in the last 15 years to mostly new it's my beat 
it's it's what I do. It, I, it my tastes have adapted to this thing. So I read lots and lots of new releases in fifteen or sixteen genres that I really like. You can see them reflected going back twenty, twenty five, thirty years in my year end Steve Reed's best and worst books of the year. You can see those genres reflected in those lists. Uh, and that becomes a problem for AJ because the the a lot of the books on this list fall under those categories right in those years. And I'm afraid uh, they fall afoul of that fact. <laughs> so the next one is Tiny Americans by Devin Murphy. Uh, and it's a yes. I read it. I thought it was tedious. Uh, I don't understand. I don't quite understand the modicum of praise that it got. I thought there was there was raw talent on the part of the author. I would happily read other things, but this one uh, it didn't it didn't have anything in the way of drama. It didn't have anything in the way of interest, and it didn't have anything in the way of interesting writing either. So uh, it's a yes, but it was just because it was dutiful. I wanted <laughs> I wanted to read it to see if. Uh, well, to see if it was worthwhile, of course, a new release like this, you want to see, it. is there a spark? Is there something that that really repays? Something that, that really interests? Something that makes you lose track of time? Uh, something also, in my case, where that I could uh, talk about with other critics. Most of whom know that I read more than they do and that I read earlier than they do. So if they want a little bit of... Uh, critics and editors that I know, if they want a little bit of a lay of the land, not to take anything at, at gospel face value... But if they want anything like the, a, a little bit of preliminary lay of the land, they know that they can ask me. Uh, and I didn't get any of that with this. Couldn't recommend it to anybody. Uh, it was good, but that's about it. Uh, but the, So we're, we're at uh, two yeses so far. We'll go on to the next one. Uh, when It Happens to You by former screen star Molly Ringwald. This is also a yes. I was hardly going to ignore it. I read celebrity attempts at literature all the time. I do it for uh, Molly Ringwald. I just recently did it for uh, one of Molly Ringwald's co-stars <laughs> who wrote, he wrote a, a, a memoir about the Brat Pack uh, that I read and kind of sort of liked. I mean, this the, the, the particular Brat Pack that Molly Ringwald was a member of uh, had, most of them had quasi-literary aspirations. Most of them thought of themselves as not just uh, moderately attractive young actors and actresses, but as as I don't even know what you would call them, some sort of salon of some kind or other. Most of them had those kinds of thoughts about themselves. Most of them, it's no coincidence, have gone on to write books. Uh, this was unexceptional. It was it was sort of plotting. I don't suspect, as I sometimes do in in celebrity books, that someone else wrote it for Molly Ringwald, but. You know, <laughs> that's as much a negative as a positive. It was it was not bad, but uh, I did read it just because when something like this comes along, whether it's Molly Ringwald or time after time after time at bat with James Franco, <laughs> I even even managed to get James Franco reviewed in the Washington Post. I'm not sure that would have happened without me, <laughs> but uh, uh, but all for naught. Uh, it whatever creative spark there was got weaker with every book and finally petered out i gather i would love it i would absolutely love it. it i would love to see more of it i would love to see more of of great actors and actresses because uh, i firmly believe that the, a lot of the creative stuff especially the language related stuff could lend itself to writing really good books and there are there are examples <laughs> there are examples of that like for instance simon cowell is a fantastic actor and also a fantastic author wrote a multi-volume biography of Orson Welles that is actually unmissable. You just you just can't miss it. Uh, so, but anyway, anyway, no, not this one. It is yes, but again, I can't I can't sing its praises. Uh, and then the next one is uh, "No One Belongs Here More Than You," a collection of stories by Miranda July. This is a yes, and it's not quite the same yes as the previous three because I'm not exactly neutral on it from the title of the collection, which is just about as quintessentially Gen Z as possible, whether Miranda July is Gen Z or is just marketing to them. No One Belongs Here More Than You is a purely 21st century attitude. 20, only pe people who were born in the 21st century reflexively, I would say defensively, re resort to this kind of thinking. I am great. I am the best. 
no one deserves this more than I do. No one deserves more than I deserve. I No one has suffered more than I have. No one is oppressed more than I have. No one is more tired than I have. It's only the people who are 21 or younger who tend to have that kind of absolutely ridiculous sentiment towards life. And, of course, one of the things that makes that sentiment so ridiculous is that it is completely uninformed. Not slightly or marginally uninformed the way the previous generation of 21 year olds was i knew that generation very well and they also had this kind of highfalutin idea about themselves but it wasn't it wasn't anywhere near as much could be because it wasn't anywhere near as litigious the attitude now can be enforced whereas the, that attitude pre-social media could not be enforced so if some young featherbrain moron uh, who got some sort of book deal because of the progressive stack or whatever, but no proven talent, says, I am the greatest thing. I am as oppressed as, as you know, slaves in Jim Crow era South or whatever. Uh, I, I am owed a multi-million dollar contract. I am owed this success. When people in the 21st century say those things, people in the previous generation did say those things, but when people in the 21st century say them, they're willing to back them up with mob action on social media and have you or your family or your company tarred as racist or transphobic or whatever, and also lawsuits. If they come for money, then they, there can be lawsuits as well. So, so it's, it's different now because it's not only more complete, there's only a fraction left of anything that even approaches what a much, much earlier generation would have called uh, the, big, the big picture or humility. <laughs> there's, there's only a fraction of that left. And uh, with the greater amount of entitlement is the lesser amount of talent. Because entitlement is the enemy of talent. If you are told, if you tell others and you force them to, to repeat it back to you, or if you're told by your parents, your nannies, your au pairs, and your extremely expensive grade school teachers that you are the best thing that has ever happened in the world, that everything you do is interesting and complex and praiseworthy, and that you're not bad at anything, ever, nothing. If you're told that from the time when you can first sue, when you can first take your first steps to the lawsuit, <laughs> then, then by the time you get to be 20 and you're in some, you know, uh, padded edged mfa program somewhere where you're being coddled because you're full korean or whatever if you if you reach that point having only been told those things about yourself then where is any kind of talent going to be refined it isn't so you will be bad at what you do you'll be very bad at what you try to do because no one's ever told you that you're not good at it no one's ever made you get better at it and I don't, again, I don't know what uh, peer group Miranda July is in, but oh my God, is this true in this collection of stories? They're awful. Just awful. Watery, limp, formless, self-impressed. Oh my God, so self-impressed. So she, the, Miranda July is the one person in the audience who is just sitting there enraptured by Miranda July's cleverness up on the stage. That's why all of the the peer group that's being pandered to in this collection, they all have that one person in the audience. That's them. And it's just going, you're the best. <laughs> uh, so no one belongs here more than you is a yes. And unlike the, the previous three, it's also an anti-recommend. It's a waste of your time. Uh, but w w uh, AJ's not doing so well. So we'll move on. The next one, the next one is not quite a face palm. It comes close. It's not quite a face palm because this author isn't that well known anymore. Uh, and yet, a moment's reflection, I think, would tell you that I would have read everything by this author. This is a journal of a solitude by uh, by May Sarton, who wrote a number of nonfiction volumes and also a number of very good novels that are well ripe for rediscovery. May Sarton, just in general, is well ripe for rediscovery. She is very, very good. She, you're going to expect me to say here that I like her nonfiction better than her fiction. In her case, it's not true. I often find her uh, her journal collections at 70 or, uh, or, or this one, Journal of Solitude, as being a little bit lachrymose, just a, just a, little, a little bit uh, heavy on the, the self-pity, a little bit heavy on the... I don't want to, I know it's going to seem funny to say that, that a journal is heavy on narcissism, but you know what I mean. There are journals and there are journals. And this is, 
I prefer her fiction. And her fiction is right for rediscovery. People don't talk about her enough. I don't think that, that May Sarton is in print right now at all. I remember uh, in the early 1990s, the late 1980s, something like that, a lot of her books had very pretty mass market, a uniform mass market edition. Very nice. The mass markets themselves looked really good. They weren't well made. They cracked the, the pages, the block of pages cracked off the, the inside of the, of the binding in less than one read. I never, I never had, I don't have any of those mass market, I don't have any Mace Arden right now. I don't have any of those mass market paperbacks, even though they were aesthetically pleasing, because there wasn't one that survived the reading, even the first reading. I admit, I'm hard on my books, but these things just were not well made. Uh, and I don't think anyone has done a, a you know, a, an uber wide reprint of May Sarton since then. And that's a shame. This is an author who has a lot to give to a reading audience. Maybe it's just time. Maybe time is just passing her by. I would hate that if that were true. But this is a yes. And you can see that AJ is starting to be in trouble. <laughs> they, we, the yeses are starting to pile up here. Uh, so let's move on and we'll hope for better. The next one, unfortunately, is also a yes. This is Summerlings by Lisa Howard. And it is a contemporary release. It is exactly the sort of thing that for the last 15 or 20 years I have been reading. I've made a point of reading it. This one is uh, uh, more clever than any of the ones that, that are on here since. This is the closest that we've come so far to a recommend. Uh, a a pre-internet adventure story of a group of kids that is done with a fair amount of heart. Uh, and much like uh, pre-internet era adventures by a group of kids, like for instance To Kill a Mockingbird, uh, the, the harsh realities of the adult world are brought into the story here and there, not with a heavy hand, not with a whole bunch of melodrama, and also not with the fog of sentimentality. I like that very much. It's a very smart book. I just didn't think it was all that original and not all that entertaining. Uh, I, I, I enjoyed reading it. I got all the way to the end without any trouble, but I couldn't, again, you know, email or call editor friends or reviewer friends and say, hey, don't miss this make sure to give this a try. You've, you've got a young family, you've got kids, you've got, you know, your Kiwanis Club or whatever, so you can't read everything. I don't have any of those things, so I can. I know you want to pare down what you should, where you should, you should uh, send your attention. Don't miss this. I couldn't really say that about the Summer Links or any of the others, <laughs> any of the other contemporary stuff on this list so far. I could definitely say it about Mae Sarton if, if Norton would reprint her in a uniform pretty edition with maybe new introductions, stuff like that, I could definitely say that. I think she would take off. I think the, the, you would get big think pieces. I think people would very much like having a new author to pay attention to. But anyway, uh, Summerlands is a yes. It's a marginally more favorable yes than all the others, but still a yes. Uh, and now you can see that, that AJ is really doing poorly so far because he doesn't have many chances left. To get on the scoreboard <laughs> that would be bad it would be bad if we uh, as much fun as i'm having as much fun as i'm having tooting my own horn it'd be bad if we had zero beans we don't want anybody to bottom out the floor like that uh so what's the next one and the next one oh the next one is a yes it's the brightlands by john fram and of all the books on this list aside from the may sarton it is the one i recommend the highest i thought it was extremely effective especially for a debut novel I have a sense that probably this is one of those debut novels that the author is just brooding over forever. Just obsessive wanting to get everything right. Because there it has a lot of moving parts. It's it's a, a coming home. It's a gay coming home story. That, that framework, that sort of uh, gimmick that we've talked about on this channel before. A uh, gay man growing up in a repressive small town uh, leaves it for L.A. or New York City in order to be a gay man, in order to have the freedom to live a gay life. And then circumstances call them back home. There was a very effective uh, book last year, I believe, about the most common of those circumstances in the last 30 years in fiction, which is AIDS. Where the, the, the gay wanderer, the gay prodigal, becomes sick and has to go back home to live with his family. Uh, those can be very effective, but there are a whole bunch of reasons why that can happen. The, the, the gimmick is infinitely expandable. The gay man coming back home, the gay prodigal is what I like to call it. it this book, uh, Brightlands, is partly that, but it's also partly a long-buried murder mystery. 
and maybe something else. I don't want to spoil any of the major elements that come out later in the book, but it's well worth your time, especially you gays. <laughs> you, you, you gays are often emailing me telling me, you know, I've, I've read this, that, and the other thing that Amazon offered me, and it was just dumb. I agree. You're being pandered to as a demographic. <laughs> Welcome to the club. <laughs> but every demographic is pandered to. That's a sign of acceptance in a way. One of the most dubious of them all. <laughs> Nevertheless, I agree. Amazon sends me those recommendations as well. But this isn't like that. Brightlands will repay your attention. It's, it's, uh, it's a yes, unfortunately, for AJ, but it's also a recommend. Uh, I don't know that it's come out in paperback yet. I'm, I don't think that I've seen it, and I'm, I know that I won't be blurbed on it because I don't think I ever wrote about it. I recommended it. Again, I recommended it to that network of friends, that network of, of writers, reviewers, and editors, uh, but I don't think I ever reviewed it myself. Uh, so I'd be interested to see. I, I don't know that I reviewed it. I don't think I reviewed it myself, and I also don't know who did. Oftentimes, I learn about who took up my recommendations when I see the paperback with the blurbs. Uh, I'll have to remember to, to look that up when I'm done with this video and see. Uh, but as you can see, we are now down to the very last choice. Uh, with no beans. <laughs> no beans so far. So will the last choice on AJ's list save the day? Let's see. The last book on the list is The Coat Route. Craft, Luxury, and Obsession on the Trail of a $50,000 Coat by Meg Lukens Noonan. And this is a no. And like I mentioned, it's, it's also one of the positive aspects of these videos because I want to read it now. Listening to AJ talk about it, I want to read it. AJ has a fascination with textile history with how clothes are made and why they're made, the forces that shape them, both aesthetic, social, and just physical. And I agree. I all, well, I don't, I don't, it's not a passion of mine, so I don't search out books like that. But whenever a book like that comes to me, I always find it fascinating. It's this thing that we all take for granted, the history of our clothes, the biography of our clothes, not just the history, but also the, the, the social elements that go into it. And AJ's description of this book made it sound fantastic. I would love to read it. I just haven't. I haven't read it. I don't think I've ever even had a copy here. So, AJ scores a bean. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> now, AJ also adds an alternative. He does not commit the sin of Bill Rutenberg. <laughs> okay, Bill Rutenberg at the Rutenberg Library added a book. He didn't add an alternative. That's what AJ does. He added a book. He said, I'm just adding an extra book. And he paid a heavy price for it. It subtracted a bean. <laughs> AJ isn't doing that. AJ is just saying, if one of the earlier books on the list was too obscure, you can substitute this one in instead. And in the spirit of completeness, I'm not going to include this book because none of these previous ones were obscure at all, except for maybe the last one. Uh, but the, the extra book, I just in case, I'll list it in the information down below, and I'll, I'll link to AJ's channel down below, just in case it interests you. The extra one was If You Go Down to the Woods by Seth Adams. And since it was added as an alternate, and it wasn't needed, there's no reason for me to opine on whether or not it would have been a bean. <laughs> I'm so terrible, aren't I? <laughs> so... That was the, al the alternate, but it wasn't needed, because this was a perfectly fair list. If anything, uh, it, the defect that it had is that uh, it, it operated almost exclusively in the wheelhouse that I have made for myself in the last 20 years. If you're going to do that, you drastically increase the chances that I will have read the book. I mean, the, I have, you know, the, I have two pronounced wheelhouses that we can talk about for the purposes of this list. One is new releases, going back as far as I have been back in the business of reviewing. And the other is the canon. You know, so uh, if you if you include uh, an Elizabeth Gaskell book, an Andre Malraux book, in this case, close to would be a May Sarton book, but May Sarton is not canonical. She seems instead to have been forgotten. Uh, but if you're going to include one of those things, something, well, I know you've heard of Camus. This is one that not many people talk about. Oh, trust me. <laughs> trust me, honey bun. <laughs> 
thousands of people have talked about that book. You just don't know it. That's all. <laughs> you just don't know it. So you may be saying to yourself, I never thought a perfect Camus book was possible. I was wrong. <laughs> but, but it's just that you don't know about the, the critical conversation that's gone on around it. That's all. It is a, a very perilous thing to choose something from the canon even broadly defined it is a very perilous thing if you choose an elizabeth gaskell and you pick an off the beaten track book or if you choose george Eliot and you pick a small what you consider to be an unknown translation work that's not going to help you much and same thing is true here for aj which is if you pick something that that is a new release you know so something within the last 15 years that has been my specialty for the last 15 years and i take my specialty seriously and it it, it bit aj here <laughs> just a bit it did so so that is your your uh your episode for today aj aj dunn reads and writes uh, i'll leave a link to the channel down below uh it was only one bean but it was a lot of fun and we're as you can as you can tell we are wide open here uh, we have now several people at one bean. We have uh, people at two beans. We have people at three beans, but nobody at even four beans, and nobody any higher than that. Now, if I seem to remember correctly, in season one, the spikes started happening later in the season. People started out low, and then the spikes started going up. Could be that will happen in season two as well. Who knows? Not many veterans of season one have returned. And so far, at least in my research, no one from the OGBG has, has weighed in. Uh, that that that's perilous in its own. <laughs> so we we shall see. Uh, we'll we'll reconvene tomorrow and see if if that contestant does any better. <laughs> Thank you, Book Two.